All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming along to listen to the talk uh, this afternoon. I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully that is all working. Uh, so it's been a fantastic day so far. I've heard some really interesting talks on various aspects of um, health careers and all the different sorts of things people can get up to. Um, some amazing talks by some of the clinical entrepreneurs and everything like that. Um, but I'm going to take things to a slightly different area at the moment and talk to you a bit about expedition medicine. So to get started, I'm going to start with a short story. And the story starts on Mount Kilimanjaro. And it was a couple of years ago, um, a few years ago now, uh, on K Mount Kilimanjaro. And this tent you see here was my home for three and a half weeks. And uh, for anyone who's been to Mount Kilimanjaro, you know it's a pretty pretty high up place. It's quite high altitude. In fact, it's the tallest freestanding mountain in the world. And it's the highest mountain in the whole of Africa. It's one of the seven summits. And to give you a bit of an idea of how high that is, imagine you're at a ski resort somewhere in the Alps. If you're at the resort level, you're usually underneath 2,000 meters. And if you go to the top of one of the ski slopes, you might be at about three, three and a half thousand meters. So double that and you get to roughly where Kilimanjaro is. It's at 5,895 meters above sea level. So that's like going to the top of Mont Blanc and then stacking six of the shards on top of each other. And that's roughly where you get to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. And obviously, as you ascend in altitude, the, the atmosphere starts to get thinner. And as the atmosphere gets thinner, the amount of oxygen that's available to breathe gets less and less. And actually, once you reach 5,000 meters above sea level, the oxygen available to breathe is about 50% that which we are having here at sea level at the moment. And so that causes problems. And this lack of oxygen uh, causes people to develop altitude sickness sometimes. And that's why it's often important that there is a medic on some of these trips. But obviously, that's not always the case. Um, and so I feel very lucky to have had the opportunity to work at high altitude on a number of occasions. But on Mount Kilimanjaro, uh, I was having a really nice lunch and um, had a good day. We were doing some, we were doing some uh, clinical reviews of people on their way up to the summit to make sure they're OK and happy to carry on. But there was one Jap who was quite behind the group. He sort of arrived a good 45 minutes after the group, was complaining of feeling really tired and quite out of breath. But when he stopped, you know, he caught his breath back. His, um, his oxygen stats were about 80%, which may sound horrific, but actually that was pretty okay for that altitude. My sats at that point were about 82%. So if you are familiar with SATs, you'll know that is low. If you're not, then at sea level, normally we would expect our oxygen levels to be sitting at around 96% and above. Uh, if you've got a chronic lung disease and you might be a smoker, your SATs might be around 90%. So 80% is really quite low and we'd be definitely getting worried if this were at sea level. But actually the oxygen available is less up there and that wasn't too bad. So we had a bit of a chat with him. And we said, OK, you know, take it easy. Make sure you're careful. Um, there wasn't any there weren't any other red flags at that point, And we said to crack on. But that evening, the sky looked something like this. It was absolutely stunning. Uh, the Milky Way was very visible. Uh, this was a photo actually I took in, in the Zara Valley in India last year. Um, but I didn't have a photo from that night on Kilimanjaro. So I thought I'd put this one up instead. And so it was a really beautiful evening, a beautiful night. And we settled down into our tents at about eight o'clock, uh, 9 p.m. to go to sleep. Go to sleep very early when you're on expedition because you sort of sink in with when it gets light and when it gets dark. But come one o'clock in the morning, we had a knock at our tent. And it was one of the, one of the guides who had uh, been accompanying the gentleman I mentioned earlier. And he said, Doctor, I'm really worried. I think this, this chap that you saw earlier, I think he's developing HAPE which stands for high altitude pulmonary edema. And this is one of the three forms of altitude sickness, and it's probably the most deadly. The other two are acute mountain sickness and high altitude cerebral edema, which is also a potentially deadly form of altitude sickness. But in high altitude pulmonary edema or HAPE, essentially the lungs are working so hard to battle the lack of oxygen that the pulmonary microvascular pressure is going up and they start to leak fluid and fluid starts pooling in the lungs. And essentially you start drowning in your own, in your own fluid. And the, the guide, he said to me, doctor, the, 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 uh, the chap, he, every time he lies down, he's getting short of breath and he has to sit up and he's starting to cough again. And he just can't catch his breath even when he's resting. And this was setting off alarm bells for me because he'd been okay earlier, but you know, he, he looked like he was struggling a bit. 
But the symptoms he was mentioning of cough and shortness of breath, even when he was resting, symptoms getting worse when he was lying down. These are all red flag symptoms that suggest he might have HAPE. And the thing with HAPE is if you stay at the same altitude and you don't treat it, it can be fatal in as little as eight hours. So it meant the clock was ticking. I spoke to my, uh, to my own guide who was with me on my team and he had previously seen HAPE a couple of times and he said, you know, it's really, really quick how people go from being okay to not being okay. And he also said it can be fatal in as little as eight hours. So I thought, right, we need to, we need to crack on and get moving. And obviously it was the middle of the night and we were wondering, you know, is there going to be, is it the right thing to evacuate him at this time or should we wait till the morning? But we made the decision that actually we don't have time to spare. So I gave some nifedipine to the guide and said, get back up to a base camp where the client was as quickly as you can, give him this nifedipine, put him on oxygen and I'll come and meet you on the way down. So fast forward to about three o'clock in the morning. And this was, this was the scene. So you can see it was pretty tough terrain. There was lots of big boulders and we had uh, the, the patient on uh, a stretcher, which has one wheel and suspension and a whole bunch of people to help wheel him down in the middle of the night. Um, but this was about three hours later because when I saw the guide, he had to get back up to base camp, give him some nifedipine, get them on the stretcher and then start going down. And I was meeting them on the way. So it'd been about three, four hours since the symptoms had started now. And in my mind, I was thinking that's four hours out of eight hours, you know, the time is running out. And when I eventually saw him on the way down, I saw them coming, it was a, a tiny little headlight in the distance. And we were trying to figure out if it was a star or not at first. And then it obviously became apparent it was a headlight. And eventually they got near enough to us uh, and and we saw that he was coming, which was a massive sigh of relief. But I went over to assess him and was horrified when I saw that he wasn't on oxygen. And he was drowsy, he was confused, he was quite blue in the face. And I checked his oxygen level at that point and it was 46%. That's really low. That's, you know, that's someone, if you saw that in an emergency department in the UK at sea level, that would be straight into intensive care, probably with intubation and everything. So he was really, really low on oxygen. And I was like, Where, where's the oxygen? Why is he not on oxygen? And it turned out the, the rest of the group hadn't realized that he was, he was uh, unwell and they'd taken the oxygen bottle to the summit just in case with the rest of the group. Um, and the, the hut had run out of oxygen. So uh, despite that, you know, he was doing okay considering. Uh, but anyway, I sent one of the guides that were with us, one of the porters to run down to the next camp uh, called Millennium. Um, which is about uh, just under 4,000 meters to grab an oxygen bottle and come back up to meet us on the way down. And it was a bit of a, a bit of a scary next few hours where we, we slowly carted him down the mountain carefully, but as quickly as we could, I was keeping an eye on him, talking to him throughout, making sure that he wasn't dropping his consciousness. And to be honest with every, every 50 meters, you could see a noticeable improvement in him. And it was a long night, but we, we evacuated him throughout the night. And eventually we made it to sunrise and we made it down to Millennium Camp. And by this point, he was on oxygen. His sats had come up to 94% just with one litre through nasal cannulae. And it was the most glorious sunrise. And you can see how high we are. If you look between the trees in the distance, you can see that there's a nice bed of clouds there, which gives you an indication of how, how high up we are above the clouds. And... He did really well. He was absolutely fine. The descent in the altitude, the medication we'd given, the oxygen we got him on, all meant that that high pressure situation in the lungs, in the pulmonary macrovasculature, had reversed and it was starting to improve very quickly. So the rest of that day, all of the porters you can see there, they carried on carting him all the way down back to back to the, the hotel where the, um, the rest of the other groups were waiting. And he made a very quick recovery back to his normal self within a couple of days without any need for further treatment. So this was a, a happy story. It was a, it was a fun, fun experience, a little bit scary at times, um, but it was some proper emergency medicine, you know, and it was with so many other aspects of um, non-technical skills that you had to bring in. Not only did I need to know about the treatment of high altitude pulmonary edema, 
you also had to diagnose it remotely based on symptoms, but also then use some of the other non-technical skills such as um, you know, evacuation planning, team leadership, uh, team playing, because actually, you know, as soon as we were into evacuation mode, I wasn't the team leader anymore. The local chaps who knew the mountain like the back of their hand, they were the ones who were who were guiding us. And so we really needed to use a lot of different skills. And that's what makes expedition medicine so exciting. You get to do medicine and you get to learn all these other skills and you get to do it in some of the most amazing places around the world. But I'm going to rewind a bit, rewind a few years and um, sort of talk a little bit about my journey of how I got here. This was a few years ago now. I was starting off as a, a foundation year one doctor um, in East Kent hospitals at the William Harvey Hospital. And it was very understaffed and it was a very difficult year. It was made okay because we were all living on site and we had a great sense of uh, community and great sense of camaraderie with the other doctors. But it was a long year and I was regularly finishing shifts at least four hours late, most, time, most of the time, to be honest. And so when it got to the end of my F1, that's a, a picture I took at the time. And I was very, very happy to be moving on to F2. But unfortunately, F2 seemed to be just never ending night shifts, more A&E, more acute medicine. And I'm not going to lie, it was starting to, to drain me out. It was starting to burn me out a little bit. And uh, this is actually a picture from uh, much more recently uh, when I was making some good use of a face mask during a night shift in a, in a room by myself. So um, if you're ever lacking an eye mask in a, on a night shift, you know where to find one now. <laughs> um, but... It was really, really tough and it was hard work. And at times it really felt like I was just putting one foot in front of the other. I was stuck on a treadmill. And like so many other junior doctors, it didn't feel like a treadmill like this. It actually felt something a bit more like this. It was an uphill battle. You know, there were so many things going against me. You know, the long nights, the long shifts, the having to miss Christmas and miss friends' birthdays and weddings. And it just felt like, you know, it was putting your head down into the wind and putting one foot in front of the other, no matter what. And that was kind of what being a junior doctor felt like. And it started to get quite grating. So why does this matter though? Well, it matters because unhappy doctors and ones that are so stuck on the treadmill don't stay doctors for that long. Of course, some of them do, but there are plenty that don't. And if you look at this uh, study in 2019 that was looking into NHS staffing trends, retention and attrition, it said that two out of every five GPs intend to quit in the next five years. What's more, it looked at the OBS and Gynae training. It's a seven year program. And they said the reported attrition rate, that's trainees who leave the training program prior to completion for OBS and Gynae, is 20 percent. So. In 2017 18, from another study, they found that one in nine staff, that's 135,000 people, left the NHS. And so it matters because if people are unhappy, if they're close to burning out, they're at risk of leaving altogether rather than, rather than carving a career that works for them. And if we look at this, it, this study highlighted that happy, motivated staff who enjoy their job are less likely to leave. It shows that more engaged staff actually provide better and safer care and are less likely to be absent. And it also shows that losing a member of staff is really expensive for the NHS. It's £30,000 per staff member that leaves. And so we start to realise that actually being a, being a medic, being a nurse or a doctor or whatever it is, you can't just put one foot in front of the other and stay on the treadmill until you pop out the other end because you might get there but you've not necessarily enjoyed it for that time, or you might not get there at all. And obviously that is a blow to yourself, your own career, your own happiness and feeling of success. And it's a blow to the, the patients that ultimately need us. So why, why does this happen? Well, it happens because we're so overwhelmed with work that we can only ever look two feet in front of ourselves. We keep putting one foot in front of the other, in front of the other, no matter what. And it means that we aren't able to see the bigger picture. We're not able to look up and see what else is out there. The reason this happens is because of this formula. This is something that gets drilled into us from a very young age, whether we're, when we're 
you know, even at an age where we're at school, before even GCSEs start happening, we get told that we need to work hard because working hard is the key to being successful. And it's only when we are successful that we will find happiness. And this is the mantra that so many of us abide by. We work really, really hard. We turn up to our shifts. We slogged away at medical school and we are successful. We graduate from medical school and then we work hard again as an F1 and an F2. And then we're successful again when we get a place on a core training program. And then we work hard and then we're successful when we pop out the other end as a registrar and so on. And so we end up in this cycle where we're constantly striving towards success, but that success ultimately leads back to more hard work. And we kind of get into a situation where we constantly have to guess what success looks like. And sometimes it may seem really obvious. Success looks like completing your foundation program, getting a training number, getting an AFP job, getting that other job. But actually that then just leads to more hard work because you need to then focus on doing well at that to be successful in that next thing. And this gold, this golden um, trophy of happiness seems to always be a little bit elusive and seems to get away from us. And so there was actually a a gentleman called Sean Aker who wrote a book called The Happiness Advantage. And he says, although this formula is kind of right, it's actually all wrong at the same time. And what he suggests is that we focus on what makes us happy first, because then the hard work is inevitable. It's easy. It's no longer hard work. It's just doing something we're really passionate about. And then the success is a given. So if we focus on the happiness first, we think, you know, is this making us happy? What I'm doing now, why am I doing it? Then actually, if we can answer that question, we can say, yes, this is what makes me happy. Then it doesn't feel like hard work and the success comes. And it doesn't have to be expedition medicine. It doesn't have to be travel that makes you happy. It might be, you know, it might be that you're a really keen neurologist and you actually are desperate to get into neurology research. And you're thinking, God, I need to, I need to do my core training and my reg training and become a consultant and all this stuff before I can get into research. And of course that's not right. If you think, you know, neurology research makes you really happy. There are so many jobs, whether you're an F3, and you want to do a clinical research job, for example, at Queen Square or up in Sheffield, there are jobs where you can do it. And it might mean you take a year out from your training program, your conventional treadmill, but ultimately you'll be a happier person and it will open doors that you didn't even know existed. But it might just be much more simple than that. And it might be that in your F1 year, you didn't get a chance to go skiing because you didn't get any annual leave. And then in your F2 year, you again didn't get enough annual leave to go skiing. And you realize that that was making you unhappy because you kept missing out on things that you like doing and you like doing with your friends who were going without you. And so that was the situation I found myself in as an F2. I was really keen to go skiing because I missed it as an F1 and I hadn't been in my final year of medical school because of uh, finals. And I was like, I really want to go skiing and that's going to make me happy. So what did I do? I started looking around for conferences and ski resorts. And I found one on uh, wilderness and expedition medicine and managed to get myself a week of study leave and managed to go skiing and it made me happy and it was great. But more importantly, it made me realize that expedition medicine existed. I had no idea that it was even a thing before that. And so it was just that tiny little opportunity of following what made me happy that made me realize there was this whole other pathway that existed in medicine. I didn't have to stay within the four walls of a hospital, within a windowless A&E department, putting one foot in front of the other on the treadmill for the rest of my life. I could actually continue to do that, but I could also mix in some expedition medicine and some travel and some adventure and see the world. And so I was thinking, I, I, I got back from that ski trip and I was meant to be going to an interview and I, I cancelled that interview because I'm like, this isn't what is making me happy right now. I don't feel like it's the right stage in my life to be doing this, uh, to committing myself to the next 40 years of work, all in the same thing. So I said, I'm going to take a year out and I'm going to focus on trying to get a job in expedition medicine. I focused on what made me happy and actually the hard work happened all by itself. It was easy. I traveled to Chamonix for the, for the wilderness medicine course, soon sent off loads and loads of emails and found myself off to Mount Kilimanjaro. And then it was off to the Sahara Desert. And from there, I started getting more into the high altitude stuff and spent a bit of time in the Himalayas and Mount Everest, uh, going to base camp, to the Indian Himalayas, uh, over to uh, a bit more in, uh, over to the Pakistan, uh, to K2 base camp. 
And after that was heading over to Cambodia for a bit of jungle after a bit more time in the Indian Himalayas. And then all the way back around the world to to Ecuador, where I was working for Kenton Cool, who was a 14 times Mount Everest summiteer. And that brought me back to to London. Uh, I was, had lots of plans for this year, um, but unfortunately, COVID 19 happened, and so that didn't happen. It's all been delayed. But it's meant that I've had the opportunity to travel the world, and for me, this is what my hard work has looked like for the last few years. It's looked like putting in the hours in the emergency department because that's the best training ground. It allows me to become a really good doctor, become really good at putting in dislocated shoulders, really good at suturing up wounds, really good at treating dehydration. And I do that day in, day out in the emergency department. And I do it because I love it, because it means that I will be a better expedition doctor if I ever have to see this stuff in the desert or, for example, a mountain or even just suturing up a, a, a foot wound that's got dirty at a, um, at a campsite. But it also, Expedition Medicine allows you to see some pretty incredible things. I've um, climbed these volcanoes in Ecuador. Uh, I was with a client who was training to go to Mount Everest this year, but unfortunately got cancelled because of COVID. Uh, and I was just working myself, a guide and, and one client. And just in, in the background, so this, this is Cotopaxi Volcano. You can see the, uh, the crater just there. But in the background, just on the horizon over there, you can see a volcano called Chimborazo. And uh, we climbed that as well, but we didn't get to the summit because of awfully bad weather. But Chimborazo is actually the furthest point on Earth from the center of, of, the, of the world. It's the closest point on Earth to space. And that's because the Earth bulges around its center, around the equator. And so actually the top of that mountain is actually closer to space um, than the summit of Mount Everest, even if it's not quite as high above sea level. But it was pretty cool to be standing there taking in this amazing sunrise over this volcano crater with the, the sulfurous fumes coming out of the crater and seeing the highest point on the planet just on the horizon. But it gives you the opportunity to meet cultures from around the world. And uh, this, this uh, young boy was living in, living in the jungle in Cambodia and had a great time playing volleyball with his, with his family. But it opens your eyes a little bit because that so many of the Cambodians we met in the jungle have survived and have a living memory of the, the recent genocide in the Khmer Rouge um, and the Pol Pot regime. It was only you know, 20, 30 years ago and they live on with that, those memories and yet somehow managed to keep themselves so happy and so enthusiastic and so friendly. And so it gives you this opportunity to see cultures from around the world. Um, I found myself going over to Mount Everest Base Camp and again, a phenomenal culture and just the most beautiful place to trek to. And that came with some of its own challenges um, because uh, one, of the, one of the participants had had uh, colon cancer um, a couple of years previously and had had a total um, abdominal surgery and had a double barreled wet colostomy. And so I had a guy trekking with me up to Mount Everest base camp who literally had barely any organs in his abdomen and he had a bag coming out which had all of his urine and his number twos in. Um, and that brings its own challenges because you really, really want to make sure he doesn't get food poisoning and doesn't get any infections that could um, affect his ability to stay hydrated. But also the mountains bring their own challenges. And I've alluded to them already uh, at the beginning, but it's not just about your, your, uh, your, your clinical knowledge. You also have to learn to use some new bits of equipment too. Um, so there's oxygen on the left there, which is very good treatment for altitude sickness. And there's something called a gamo bag or a portable altitude chamber there on the right. And that is uh, as a last resort. If you can't descend and you don't have oxygen, then you can use one of these bags if you've got one with you to put someone inside and inflate it and increase the relative pressure inside. And it, it gives them an equivalent of descending by about one and a half thousand meters in altitude. And that can save someone's life if you're an extremist and you don't have any way to get out of the situation you're in. You've got no way to descend. But they come with their own difficulties because it's very claustrophobic in there. It would be very cold. Uh, you don't have easy access to the patient. You know, you can't just unzip them suddenly. And, you know, if they start vomiting, you can't just unzip it very suddenly because that would lead to a sudden drop in the pressure inside and it would pop their eardrums and potentially cause barotrauma. So these are all things that you need to be considering when you're using a piece of equipment like this. And then in the middle, you'll see some of the drugs that I uh, will commonly take on any um, mountain expedition. Um, and you see I've got it in a reflective silver pouch. 
And the reason I do that is because when you're, you're climbing at night, or you're up high altitude, you might be battling temperatures as low as minus 20 degrees, minus 30 degrees. And a lot of these drugs aren't heat stable. And so if they freeze, then they're as good as done. You know, they're not very much use even if you saw them again. So you need to make sure that your, your medications stay well looked after. And so I, the way I do it is I keep them in a, in a foil lined uh, container like that. I put a heat pouch on the outside and then wrap that in a, in a, in a jumper. So you, you have to learn to use a few new things and you have to take into account and consideration lots of other skills that you won't have even considered in your, in your day job in the hospital. But learning these things is an amazing challenge in itself and it is fascinating and it allows you to go to places like northern Pakistan. And this campsite here is called Concordia. It's right at the top of the Baltoro Glacier and it's the origin of the Indus River, which then travels down through Pakistan and through India um, and brings life-giving water to so many thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. And it's pretty amazing to be standing there at Concordia, which is nicknamed the throne room of the gods because of all of the mountains around you. There's over 40 mountains, over 7,000 meters surrounding you that you can see from that point. Um, and this, was a, this was a gentleman with high altitude cerebral edema, um, a very tricky evacuation, uh, which took about five hours. Uh, we're at 5,200 meters there, and it took a whole load of us, a lot of work and a fair bit of oxygen to get him down. But again, he, he recovered very nicely. And I just had to put this photo up from the same expedition in India, where you get an idea of how incredible the stars are. Uh, when you're in some of these places, you're miles away from light pollution uh, and, you know, the, the air is very clean and you can just see the most incredible stars. And just on the right of the word India there, you've got a shooting star coming down through the picture. So it's one of my favorite photos I've, I've taken. Um, so done a lot of talking and it's time to think about what, what happens next. Well, the expedition medicine that I've done so far uh, is you know, it's just the first step on the way to the, the, the other opportunities that are out there. The British Antarctic Survey takes doctors down to Antarctica for eight to 18 months. You can go away with the Zoological Society of London, which takes the doctors, doctors on their, um, their marine conservation trips into the British Indian Ocean Island territories uh, doing manta ray research. They take doctors there. If you want, you could go and work for Time and Tide Hotels in Madagascar and be a doctor on an island there in a luxury hotel resort uh, that does safaris. Or you can go and be a doctor on some of the, or a medic, I'm saying doctor, you can be a medic, a nurse, paramedic, I'll come on to that in a bit, um, on, uh, on TV sets and to take part in uh, massive events such as the world's toughest race. Or you could go and work for someone like NASA who have medics on their programs as well. So there are so many opportunities out there. And I feel like what I've done has really just, just been uh, the first step on the ladder towards all the other opportunities. But that's a bit about my journey. And now I wanna tell you a little bit about how you can get involved with Expedition Medicine. If you're listening to this thinking, wow, that is something I want to be able to do. So next steps. The first thing to remember is that to be a good expedition doctor or an expedition medic, firstly, you need to be good in that expedition environment. And secondly, you need to be a good medic. There's no point only ever going on expeditions and just doing expedition medicine and nothing else because it means you will massively de-skill. De I've never put a dislocated shoulder back in on an expedition. And yet in the emergency department, we might do it every couple of months, you know, on my shifts. And so you get a much higher exposure to things. If I'm doing a minor shift, I'll be suturing up people regularly, dealing with twisted ankles, dislocated fingers, all of these kinds of things you deal with regularly. And um, during COVID, I was working in intensive care there. And, you know, it allows you to deal with really, really sick patients. And you get that clinical exposure and the day in, day out hard work that you really need to actually be a good medic. And so there's no point going on an expedition if you're not going to be able to bring the clinical skills that you are meant to be offering by being there in the first place. But secondly, you aren't going to be a very good expedition medic if you can't deal with that environment. You need to be able to know that you're going to deal with altitude okay yourself. You need to be able to be confident that actually you can trust your feet to carry you 120 kilometers through the desert. 
you need to have that confidence in you. And so if you've never, ever done anything like that, then start start training, start pushing yourself, seeing if you can, seeing if it is something you can do. And you'll be surprised. You you actually will pick up a lot more than you, you think you can do. For example, walking 120 kilometers through the desert sounds like a lot of work, but it actually wasn't that bad. And if you imagine putting on a really good pair of walking shoes and a 10 kilo backpack and going for a 10 kilometer walk um, or a 20 kilometer walk around the city or in the countryside, wherever you live in the UK, then that's pretty much the same sort of thing it's going to be. Uh, so obviously there's a couple of other considerations, but you need to be familiar with your own physical ability and, and fitness before you go into these things. And that brings me on to this document, which is the updated guidance for medical provision for wilderness medicine. It's published by the Royal College of Surgeons Edinburgh, and it sets out a framework for what is required of an expedition medic. And in there, it gives you a set of what we like to see, what's nice and familiar to us. It gives you essential and desirable criteria, but it also breaks it down into non-technical skills, expedition experience, activity proficiency, and wilderness medical expertise. So those top three sections are all about the expedition. You know, there's no point going on a mountaineering expedition if you've never um, worn a pair of crampons in your life or you've never carried an ice axe. Although that being said, you might be able to go as a medic on an expedition where the clients also are in the same boat as you and you can learn alongside them. It's actually quite a nice way of developing some of these skills. But what I'm going to focus on is this wilderness medicine bit at the bottom. And you'll see that actually doctor or prescribing healthcare pr practitioner only comes down at number three. Number four is where it says highly experienced, usually doctor, it doesn't have to be, expedition medicine practitioner working at consultant level. But one and two, that's advanced first aid training. And then there's level two, which is advanced extended care practitioner training. Um, and so it goes to show that it doesn't matter what type of medic you are, whether you're a nurse, a doctor, a paramedic, a physician associate, if you've got the relevant experience, then actually you can be an expedition medic. You just need to go and um, make sure you have the expedition experience as well. But not only that, you, you don't have to have the experience now. And certainly when I discovered expedition medicine existed, when I went on that, um, that ski trip, I certainly didn't have the experience that I needed. And so this is, this is what the, that box shows. I've sort of broken it down and written it out. So it says that the essential criteria, you need to have emergency medicine experience. This is for the level three, for the, the doctoral prescribing healthcare practitioner. Um, the reason I'm focusing on this is because the first two levels about advanced wilderness first aid, a lot of the leaders that go on these expeditions will have that skill anyway. So if the companies are looking to take a medic, they want to take someone who brings more to the expedition than just the leader and their first aid skills. And so I'm focusing on, on the level three here and it says, for that, you need the essential criteria of emergency medicine, confidence in minor injuries and general practice problems, and a wilderness exhibition medicine course. So I found myself in a situation where actually I had done emergency medicine as, uh, as a junior doctor, a foundation doctor. I had done general practice as a foundation doctor, and I'd just been on a five-day, a six-day um, expedition medicine course in the Alps. So I was taking those essential criteria, but then I was thinking, what about my desirable ones? And... Um, having actually worked in general practice desirable, I'd done that. I'd done my ATLS, I'd done my ALS, and I'd, I was uh, on route to becoming an instructor at that point. And uh, I'd actually added in this bit about psychiatry because mental health concerns come in quite a bit on expedition medicine. Now, it's not written in, in that guidance, but I think it is useful to have some exposure to that. And to be honest, you'll get a lot of that in general practice and emergency medicine. And the other one is pre-hospital. And this for me was the obvious area where I was lacking. I, as a medical student, was a community first responder. I was really interested in pre-hospital emergency medicine and I did two medical electives with Air Ambulance Trusts. And so I'd had a bit of experience, but I'd not had that much experience as a doctor in the pre-hospital world. And so I thought if I wanna be an expedition medic, I don't want the first time I'm looking after someone uh, to be by myself on the side of a mountain. And so I started doing some pre-hospital work in the UK and I would work uh, for different companies that had good senior cover, um, uh, such as sports medics or uh, exile medics and world extreme medicine and action challenge. And you can go and work at things like ultra marathons or um, uh, big events like the London Marathon, or I worked at the European Championship Games up in Glasgow. Um, and there are loads and loads and loads of events where you get some really good pre-hospital medicine 
um, but with some additional support. And it's really good to get yourself familiar with that environment. And I'd say the most important thing I learned from that is actually in the in the endurance events where you learn to manage loads of blisters, loads of dehydrated people, loads of people who are just exhausted and heat related illnesses. And you see a lot of that at these events. And this is the kind of stuff that becomes your bread and butter on expedition. And so it's really good to have that experience. Of course, there's qualifications you can do, but do note that qualifications are all fairly new to the game and loads of them are springing up. Um, but they're not actually listed anywhere on that faculty guidance for wilderness medics. However, it is a, it does give you a good way to get yourself a qualification, learn more about it, and go in armed with knowledge and um, opportunities for networking. So there's plenty of opportunities out there. Um, and what if you are a medical student now? So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how you can go about building up your skill set from whatever stage you're at now. So if you're a medical student or you're a nursing student or paramedic student, then maximize your opportunities. So go to a conference, go to the World Extreme Medicine Conference, you know, engage with your society, um, whether that's, you know, the uh, there's loads of good ones out there. Lots of universities have their own wilderness medical society and emergency medicine societies. Join them and go to the events and connect with people. You know, drop people a message on Instagram. You know, if anyone's interested, you're more than welcome to message me on Instagram at expedition underscore doctor. And I'll be, make uh, my best effort to get back to all of you as soon as I can. But also develop your skills. Um, you know, go on courses, be a first aider at events, be a first responder and develop your expedition skills. If you see yourself as a diving doctor, go diving regularly. If you want to see yourself in the mountains, go and climb some mountains with friends. Um, and just engage and really try and develop that skill set as a student. And then once you um, become, a, I'm, I'm focusing this next bit on doctors just because this is the pathway I've gone through. Um, but essentially, you could read this as any anything else as well. It'd be the same if you're a nurse or paramedic. Um, and so you want to make sure you've got the clinical skills. So you need emergency medicine experience, you need general practice experience, and you need some pre-hospital experience because this is exactly what you're going to be doing. Um, I sometimes get surgeons or uh, radiologists asking me, you know, can I be an expedition doctor? And my question to them is, are you the right person for the job? And secondly, why do you want to do expedition medicine? Um, and if they have actually got loads of emergency medicine experience in their background, they're familiar with general practice stuff and they've done some pre-hospital stuff, or they're willing to take a break from their current trajectory to go and get that experience, um, then absolutely great. But expedition medicine isn't just an opportunity to have a free jolly up a hot up, up a mountain somewhere. You are taking responsibility for people's lives. And so if you're putting your name on that indemnity certificate, you need to be confident that you are the right person for the job. Um, and they should go on courses. So make sure you've got your ATLS course, your ALS, your expedition medicine. Go on um, other specific training courses, uh, such as those by World Extreme Medicine, Wilderness Medical Training. There's a whole load of other organizations up there. And lastly, again, just to emphasize the relevance of expedition experience. And so lastly uh, is post-foundation. So by now, you should have experience in emergency medicine, general practice, pre-hospital, you've got your courses, and you've been on expedition medicine course, and you've developed some of your activity-specific skills. So it'll be time for your first expedition. And before you know it, you'll be sleeping under the stars in places like this. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. That was so wonderful and important. Sorry, I, I can't really hear you properly. The sound keeps cutting out. Hello. The first question was, what A-levels did you do? What A-levels did I do? So I did uh, biology, physics, chemistry, and uh, music. And then I think the, the follow-up that they were probably expecting is what, why did you select those ones? Um, I selected them because they were, it was something that I always found interesting at school. I was always interested in the sciences. 
Um, I liked the way it allowed me to find out a bit about how the world worked and how the body worked. Um, and I found it, I just was slightly better at the sciences because they usually had a kind of right or wrong answer. Whereas the humanitarian, the, the humanities, like history and stuff like that, I really struggled with a lot more. Um, and so I was always sort of tending towards the sciences. And then when it got to around A levels, by that point, I was already thinking about um, possibly applying for medical school. And so I was uh, considering um, what A levels would suit that. Uh, although I, I must say I did actually try and change one of my A levels to geology, but it was kind of a bit late at that point, point. Um, and that was sort of me thinking, oh, maybe I'm interested in in the outdoors and wonder what opportunities uh, could exist there. And so I never actually expected to be able to combine my love for the outdoors now with with a career in medicine. But turns out you can pretty much do whatever you want with any career you, that you have. So it worked out okay in the end. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, someone's asking about um, front borders. I think um, that's friends of MSF. Uh, sorry, so, say that again. Um, someone asked about um, without borders or friends of MSF. Whether it's good to um, get involved with that, I think. Uh, okay, yeah. So the 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 expedition medicine I've been talking about has been focusing on uh, the non humanitarian and global health side of things, but there is the global health humanitarian side, which does fall under the category of sort of expedition wilderness medicine, sort of. Um, they're related. Um, for um, getting involved with global health and humanitarian things, I think it's it's definitely a good thing, but only if it's done in the right way. And you need to be making sure that you are the right person for the job and you have the skills that are necessary. And actually, uh, for me, it, it's not the right stage in my journey yet to be doing some of that. And that's something that I want to do probably in five or 10 years time where I've got a lot of experience to bring. Um, and there's, there is a slight danger with some of these things that people get involved with global health and humanitarian medicine as a way of almost as a sort of clinical tourism or they'll use things like you know saying it gives you the opportunity to practice procedures that you wouldn't get the exposure to at home and there's lots of dangerous things that uh, come out in with these sorts of mindsets and sort of almost tends towards a colonialism type mindset and this white savior complex and it's very important that we are careful to avoid these things and it's something that we um as people who are coming from a position of privilege we need to be aware of that and so they're absolutely good things to be doing, but only if it's for a right, the right organization where they are really taking into account the consideration of the local population, making sure there isn't any of this colonial approach where it's sort of very top heavy, but it's actually more about developing uh, shared, shared knowledge, shared understanding and helping support local services rather than just bringing in a, a sort of a savior and making sure that you've got the right skill set and it's the right time for you. So absolutely, MSF is great and it's something that I will be hopefully doing at some point in the future, but now's not the right time for me. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Um, I think a lot there, there are a lot of um, charity organisations which sometimes, um, well, I'm not, not necessarily friends with MSF, I'm sure they're a great organisation, but some, um, they sort of appear as though they're um, helping out and, um, you know, contributing to um, whatever charity were there, but really when you ask around the local communities they're not benefiting as much from it whereas some other organizations which don't do it so much as for the publicity or to look as though they're doing something good where are actually some of the best organizations there um supporting the yeah. communities yeah exactly um, and i think yeah. this digital age actually some uh, there's you know sometimes it's not quite the so glamorous the stuff that actually makes a difference but you know something that is really really useful that has come about more in uh, recent times is things like telemedicine training events so that's where you're empowering the local uh, medical uh, staff by delivering training that has come out of a you know some some like uk training program but it's being delivered remotely and that's not very glamorous for the person delivering the training you know they're sat in front of a computer in their living room uh, or in a or in a hospital department somewhere delivering training via via zoom but actually it is exactly 
the best thing for them because it empowers the local people. It doesn't introduce any of this sort of clo- po- you know quasi colonial type behavior, and it's really valuable. But that's the kind of thing that doesn't look quite so sexy on the you know to to outside people and people don't necessarily think oh yeah that's exactly what i want to do it's so exciting but actually sometimes that is the the best way forwards yeah i definitely totally agree um so the next question is even though it wasn't what you were enjoying really so i think they're talking about um your time in hospital do you appreciate spending some time in a hospital environment before beginning expedition medicine yeah, absolutely. I uh, I didn't not enjoy it. I was enjoying the work. I was loving being a doctor, but at the same time, I was feeling so uh, so so much like there wasn't anything else. It was like that was my entire life, and I got to a point where you know I'd been doing that for a few years, and I was like, I don't want this to be my entire life. There's so much else that's out there, and it was literally just that one experience that allowed me to open my eyes and see everything else that was out there. So it's not that I I didn't really enjoy it. I did enjoy it. Um, it just wasn't everything that I wanted to, to be my entire life for the rest of my life. Uh, but the I would also say that it was absolutely necessary, and that's because you need to first and foremost be a good medic before you get anywhere near the expedition environment. Um, because if you have to manage someone with even something like uh, severe dehydration from traveler's diarrhea, if you're not used, you know, it might be that as a as an F1 you put in a few cannulas. But, you know, unless you've put in loads and loads of cannulas and you've put up their, their IV fluids and connected the giving set and you've drawn up the drugs and you've given the drugs and you've given IM injections and you've known how to um, balance things like Imodium and antibiotics, um, then you're not going to be a very good expedition medic. And so you need to be trying to get that, uh, that specific experience in a safe environment uh, in hospital before you think about taking those skills to to the side of a mountain. Uh, thank you. Um, thanks, Dr. David. Um, the next question is, do you feel well supported as a doctor on these expeditions or do you work autonomously? Uh, it varies. Uh, so it uh, depends entirely on the organization and um, who you're working for. So there are some companies where you might be one of several medics. So for example, British Exploring Society, they will generally only ever take an experienced expedition medic if it's a sole, a sole medic. But if it's actually um, multiple expedition medics, then they will make sure there's always a senior expedition medic and then more junior ones so that you're paired with people who can support you. Um, if you're working for a company like the British Antarctic Survey, then you will have uh, telemedicine support 24-7 via satellite phone or internet. Um, and then there are other companies where you might just be the only person. Um, there's, a, there's a company I've worked for where uh, they've got a sort of a safety officer working for the company, but no medical people there. And uh, so you need to be confident that you can act autonomously as well. So. Okay, thank you for that. Um, next question is, is becoming an expedition, expedition doctor a one-way path, i.e. can you be an expedition doctor for X number of years and then return and become a specialist? So you can absolutely do both. And I think the most one of the most important things is that you should never forget that you need to first and foremost be a good medic. And that means you need to be doing the, the day job, you know, day in, day out where you're seeing patients and the expeditions just get slotted in here and there. And if you're at a stage where you want to build up a lot of experience as an expedition medic, then, uh, yeah, it's much easier to do that if you're not on a on an NHS training pathway that's full time. But you can absolutely do it alongside uh, part-time jobs, part-time training. Um, so for a couple of the last years, I've been doing part-time junior clinical fellow jobs, one in intensive care and one in emergency medicine. Um, and that allowed me enough time to squeeze in, you know, the expeditions here and there. And a lot of expeditions are only a week long, so you can put it in your annual leave um, or, st- or study leave sometimes if you've got a friendly uh, educational supervisor. Um, but also there's other ways to do it. And if, for example, you can, if you're on a training program, uh, you, if you've got a, a 
a foundation program director or you've got a training program director who's supportive of you, they will often give you some extra time out to go and follow your expedition medicine aspirations. And you can take years out in between training jobs as well. So I think, you know, um, it's not a case of expedition medicine or training. They can absolutely go hand in hand. And there are lots of people who do it. But you also need to consider the alternatives as well. And there are people who have very successfully uh, gone on to be consultants still, uh, but they've done it sort of by their own route and gone down the sort of Caesar pathway where you uh, essentially build your own training program. But that's quite a lot of administrative work and you have to do a lot of work to prove your competencies. But essentially, whatever, whatever pathway you want to do, there will be a way of making it work. You just need to speak to enough people and ask the right questions. So would you say it's easier to become, um, say, like an A&E &E, &E doctor um, with your experience as an um, expedition medic and then later become a consultant in, um, as opposed to other specialties which aren't so sort of um, emergency medicine related? Yeah, so uh, certainly I'd say I'd say more the other way around. My experience in the emergency departments made me a better expedition doctor, but also also vice versa. You know, all of the skills I've learned as an expedition doctor, whether it's from screening participants before going on expedition to planning a medical kit to planning evacuations and think you're always having to think three or four steps ahead. And also that independence, the team leading, team, uh, team playing, uh, team member playing um and dealing with lots of different things it's definitely made me a better ex uh, emergency doctor um but it's not just emergency medics there are loads of gps who actually just go through foundation training do their three years and come out as a gp and then go into expedition medicine and that is a very very sensible way of doing things as well you'll be bringing a lot to the table and so much of what you do on expedition is actually about general more general practice type things rather than um you know severe emergencies as such but you do need both both of those uh, skill sets but there's no reason to suggest why actually if you do some expedition medicine you get some experience in a and e that actually you can then you, you would then be able to go on to do something else like surgical training or robson gynae or, or whatever else and you'll always have that experience it will never mean that you're disadvantaged for doing the rest of your career it'll just happen a little bit later and even if you spent five years or ten years doing expedition medicine and A&E um, junior clinical fellow jobs or clinical fellow jobs or locum shifts then actually by the time you get on to being a train on a training program for something else you'll just have that much more experience to be able to bring to what you do then and it will make you a better a better medic as a result yeah definitely I um, totally agree with that yeah um i think we've got yeah we've got quite a few questions are you happy to continue taking them yeah sure I think we, yeah yeah okay um let's see so someone said they've noticed your fellow the royal geographical society what inspired you to become a fellow and how does this link in with your expedition medicine work? Uh, so the Fellowship of the Royal Geographical Society is uh, something that's done by appointment. Uh, so I essentially had someone mention it to me a few months back and I started asking around and speaking to some people and got in touch with the person who heads up the fellowship program at the, the RGS. And um, turned out it was a bit of a small world but she'd been meaning to message me for a while she'd said and so our, our paths kind of clash um collided like that and essentially they the frgs um program or the, the rgs the royal geographical society they have a whole section within it devoted to expedition medicine um but kind of more broadly to expedition safety and so for a lot of british companies and international companies that run expeditions they have to adhere to um something called the british standard 8848 which is written by the royal geographical society and the rgs has this whole section devoted to safety um and has a, a research interest as well headed up by prof chris witty um and so that that there were loads of things that were related to expedition medicine, which I thought was really, really exciting. And when I spoke to the um, the membership director at the RGS, she said, you know, I think your experience is, is fantastic as well. You've been on expeditions all over the place. You've I've got a lot of experience in, out, in high altitude medicine now, um, in particular evacuating Hayes and Hape. Um, and 
uh, I have an interest in the photography as well and raising awareness for the existence of expedition medicine. And so she said, you know, I'm more than happy to to recommend you as a as a fellow. And uh, then uh, someone else had to second me, and that was the uh, the person who's in charge of the British Exploring Society, who I've worked for as a doctor before. And so, yeah, a few months ago, got uh, made an FR, FRGS, which was a great honour and very, very unexpected. Yeah, that's really great. Congratulations. Does that mean you only need two two people to nominate you to become a fellow? Uh, yeah, so you then ha you have to submit an application, um, talk about your experience, your the relevance of your work, and um, what you'll bring to the to the society, and then someone has to nominate you and someone has to second you at a, a meeting that gets voted in. So that's my understanding of how that side of it works, but I haven't sat on that side of it. All right, okay. So I was just wondering um, for for um, FRCS and other things on the possibly it's quite similar i'm not entirely sure so uh um, it's, it's slightly different. Yeah. fellowship of the the royal medical colleges uh which is a it's an exam it's not a nomination thing um whereas the so you know if you pass your exams anyone could become a, a fellow of the rcp or the rcs for example um yeah the rgs is very different it's a sort of membership by appointment type thing uh so if you're passionate in uh, something to do with the outdoors and you feel like you can bring something then um, absolutely get in touch with them and and uh, see whether you can become one all oh, right okay that makes sense okay um thanks for that uh, someone asked oh this one's quite relevant someone said um are you still able to do work when you're not on an expedition especially at the moment during covid uh, yeah, so um, at the moment I do locum shifts in emergency department um, for the six months prior to that. Uh, so from January till August this year, I was uh, a junior clinical fellow in ITU. So I was working pretty much all the time in intensive care. And the whole of the year before that, I was a, a junior clinical fellow in emergency medicine. So uh, plenty of opportunities to work. And there are lots of shifts available as, uh, as a locum as well. Uh, fulfilling in in the gaps um, but the the nice thing about uh, doing the clinical fellow roles is that you get some job security as well so you're on a contract you get your shifts um, and so yeah there, there's different ways of making it work um, and I've got lots of lots of friends and colleagues who are you know incredible expedition medics with loads of experience who are on a completely bog standard NHS training pathway and they just fit it in around fit it in around their uh, clinical commitments in the NHS. Yeah, that's really good. Um, yeah, I think that's one of the things about um, medicine, especially during these times, is luckily we have the sort of security to know that we'll always be needed and we'll always have work to do, but some um, other people who are more in the more independent sectors don't have um, that same luxury, so a lot of them are out of work, unfortunately. Mm. Um, I'm trying to see if there's any more questions. <clears throat> If you ha if you hadn't done expedition medicine, what would you have done? Uh, so my my plans initially when I was a first, second, third year medical student was to become a surgeon, um, and that's still sort of on the back of my mind somewhere. Uh, but then when I was in clinical school, I discovered emergency medicine, and I thought it was amazing. And then discovered pre hospital emergency medicine, I thought that was even more amazing. And so my my plan before discovering expedition medicine was to go through foundation program, do my ACCS, and get on uh, the sort of training pathway to becoming an A and E uh, consultant with the plan to work on on HEMS at some point. Um, but I realized that if I just smashed through it all, you know, one step after the next like that, I would be getting to consultancy at around, you know, my early thirties. And, you know, that then gives me another 35 years of doing the same job, uh, over the rest of my life. So I, I was like, I, I really don't have any rush to get there. And, um, since I realized that you don't have to follow the trend, you don't have to do what everyone tells you is the norm. And that there are other, are other options. And I started speaking to people. I realized that there were so many other um, possibilities out there. And, um, you know, I don't have to just 
crack on with the pathway it's more than okay to take a few years out to you know do work in A&E and ITU and expedition medicine alongside that and so I've been kind of trying to develop my clinical experience uh sort of part-time alongside the expedition medicine but yeah I'm still I still want to work on HEMS that's still in the pipeline uh, but that'll be a couple of years from now and then further down the line probably as a A&E uh, specialist that's the plan. Yeah, I think that's a really good um, point you raised because um, the, the traditional routes that we're taught about to sort of choose your um, specialty really early on and then follow the career path once you become a consultant. But nowadays, mm. I'm seeing a lot of the younger generation there um, sort of wanting to do medicine, but having um, something else they, they could do on the side or commit a bit more time to their um, other interests. So uh, I see a lot of students on social media now who are sort of becoming mm -hmm. influencers creating um, YouTube channels to provide education. So um, they mm -hmm. want to become um, sort of an education provider as well as a clinician. So a lot of yeah. people are trying to do something other than just, you know, the one job. I, I think it's really, it's really important. And as you might remember, one of the slides I put on early on was um, showing the attrition rate of trainees. And it's because you kind of get, it's quite anonymous being stuck in this enormous system where you are working your socks off, becoming a consultant uh, on the training treadmill. And actually, if you can allow yourself the headspace and the, the time to follow some other interests, so for example, you know, um, medical education, if that's something you're interested in, or whether it's expedition medicine, or maybe it's being a research assistant on the side of your, your main job, or maybe it's something completely unrelated, maybe it's management or joining the NHS Clinical Entrepreneurs Programme. You know, all of these little side interests are the kind of things that give you passion for actually being a, a medic in the first place. And giving yourself the time to follow up on these passions means that you will start to enjoy your job of being a doctor more as a result, and you won't resent the fact that you're married to your career. And that's certainly what I found doing expedition medicine is that I absolutely love working in A&E now. And I, you know, I look forward to going to work. So I'm like, great, this is an opportunity to practice some of the things I might have to do on, on an expedition. Um, and so, you know, everyone I speak to that's done something a little bit unconventional, you know, they, instead of being on a full time training program, they've done an 80% training program and it's taken them one extra year to become a consultant. But alongside that, they get to spend a day a week in a research lab, for example, or a day a week thinking about, um, you know, some new health startup or doing YouTube videos. You know, it makes everyone so much more passionate about their actual core job, which still stays as being, being a medic. So. Yeah, definitely. I totally agree. And I think it'd definitely be good for medical students to be made, um, you know, more aware of these opportunities, because I think, um, you know, having a passion for your profession, because you're going to be doing it for a very, very long time, it's, it's good to maintain your interest and um, it will, will sort of benefit your mental health as well, being able to um, follow through with your other um, side, so you have alongside medicine. So I think that's, that's Absolutely. a really big point. Um, so I think that is all the questions. Um, oh, there's one more, one more question. Um, <laughs> yeah. Do you know if you do expedition medicine in the armed forces, mainly the Royal Navy? Uh, so that that's a an interesting question. I would say. Uh, it's interesting because if you join the armed forces, pretty much your whole job is all about expedition medicine. Um, you know, if you're being deployed uh, out as a ship's doctor, like someone else was talking about earlier, or if you're deployed to, um, you know, a war zone, that that's all amazing uh, opportunities within expedition medicine. But beyond that, you often have to give support to troops on training exercises um, and you get the opportunities to go and develop your skills as like a backcountry ski instructor. Like there are so many opportunities to be outdoors uh, doing expedition medicine in the armed forces. And obviously the armed forces will it make it's great for you because developing all these skills it makes you better um in the armed forces and so they will pay for all these trainings they will pay you for to do all of this stuff uh which is great um and you know i i applied to join the army reserves but i got rejected because i've got a nut allergy um mild one so that was a bit annoying <laughs> um, but anyway i think there are loads of opportunities within the armed forces so absolutely have a think about that and if it's something you want to do don't uh feel like expedition medicine is and not possible it absolutely is 
Thanks for that, Dr. Nathan. I think um, we've just come up to time. So um, we're going to have to end it um, there. Um, do you say you have any contacts if you'd um, want people to submit questions to? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, um, my contact details are down at the bottom there. If, uh, hopefully you can see that. So um, feel free to email me. It's nathanjhp at doctors.org.uk or you can drop me a message on Instagram at expedition underscore doctor. And I'll be more than happy to get in touch with anyone uh, who drops me a question through there. Okay, then I'll put that, um, I'll put that in the chat for you then. Great, so thank you so much. Uh...